Uh, let's go ahead and open up to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. And we went through the first 10 verses last week, so I think 11 still comes after 10, right? So that's where we're picking up this evening is chapter 4, verse 11. And, uh, you know, he's continuing to, in verse 11 really, he's wrapping up this warning uh, that we looked at last week. And so remember, just a brief recap, I uh, always like to do review. I think it's super beneficial. I know it is for me, and I get, hear a lot of feedback of how helpful it is. And, you know, it, to to not take it for granted that because I've been spending so many hours upon hours studying through the weeks uh, that you guys aren't having that type of time to, to dig into the book of Hebrews. And perhaps you are, and praise God if you are, and that's that's awesome. Um, but for a lot of us, I think for most of us here, you probably haven't been in there since last week. So let's remember and refresh our minds what we've been talking about. Uh, this letter of Hebrews is written. Uh, we're, it, the author is uncertain, but we certainly know that the actual author is the Holy Spirit, right? As we know that all scripture is inspired by God. And so uh, whoever the man is that penned it, uh, we know that it comes from God. And so um, with that being said, who is his target audience? Uh, who, who is the target audience? Remember, always setting ourselves back into the context of when this was written. Okay, so first century um, church. What is the context that we're talking about? Who's the uh, who's the intended audience here? Jews, Jewish, Jewish okay, Jews, Jewish people, specifically. Uh, maybe we would call them Messianic Jews, right? Jews that believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Um, so they would really be a minority, right? As far as Israel goes and as far as the Jews go, because most of them did not believe and still do not believe uh, that Jesus is the Messiah. Um, so he is writing to these Jews, and, and, and so we've seen him building a case, if you will, right? Kind of think of an attorney in, in, a, in a courtroom setting, and uh, he's building this case, and he's building this case uh, to, to present the facts to them. Uh, to, to convince them, right, to, to convert some of them. Because remember, this is a letter, and really it's like a sermon, okay? If you just read through this, it's pretty much a sermon, and a very evangelistic sermon, as we see many uh, warnings that are, are callings to, you know, uh, as he says in uh, verse 1 of chapter 3. Uh, that stuck out of my mind in the sermon yesterday also. Um, that one just keeps coming back. He says, consider Jesus, right? Consider Jesus, uh, and so it is written to the church, but just as it is churches today, there's non-believers in here, right? He, he's certainly writing to believers, but there are non-believers hearing these words and reading these words. And so um, he wants to continue to build this case. And to the Jews, why would it be important that he, he unpacks some of these things? Think about some of the stuff we've seen so far. That the theme is, remember, Jesus is superior, right? Uh, he, he's supremacy of Christ, superiority of Christ. He is greater, if you will. Uh, what are some of the things that we've seen? What has he laid out the case thus far? So what's he said? Jesus is greater than who or what? The angels, Moses. Angels, Moses. Okay, the angels and the law, right? Jesus is greater than angels and law. Jesus is greater than Moses and the promised land. Uh, greater than Joshua. Even remember we talked about him last week, how... Uh, you know, Moses passed the baton to Joshua. Joshua uh, went to lead the people into the promised land. Um, but remember that most of them fell in the wilderness and did not enter into the rest. And, and why is that? Why did they fall in the wilderness and they did not get to go into the promised land? Good. Because of unbelief. Okay. Because they were non-believers. Um, you know, that they were unable to enter. Where is that? Uh, verse 19. Last verse of chapter 3. We see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. And that's where he starts the second warning now. Don't be like Israel, right? Don't harden your hearts, as he says. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts like Israel did and, and not enter the rest but fall in the wilderness because of their unbelief. Don't be like that. Rather, believe in Jesus Christ, right? Today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. Believe in Christ. Consider Christ. Come to Christ and enter into his rest. Right? That's, that's the second warning, is to, to do that. And the first warning was exactly the same thing. Uh, we found that in chapter 2, after he talked about how Jesus is better than the angels and the law. And he says, hey, if the angels brought the law, and you held them in such high esteem, and there's consequences for not obeying them, how much higher are the consequences if you don't listen to Jesus, this greater messenger, with the greater message, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ? Right? See it? 
So it, again, it's it's laying the case out. And, and so my question back to it, as I actually did remember that I started a question before this five minute monologue, uh, the question was, why is he stating all that? Why is he saying all these things? <clears throat> what do you think about the angels and Jesus and Moses and Joshua? And he's better. Why why is he saying all this? They probably bring a lot of baggage through the Jewish religion, of elevating whether it be angelic beings or Moses. Okay. Yeah. Um, They're living in the Old Testament. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, and they're certainly, you know, to tie Dave and Adam's points together, yeah, they are the Old Testament, right? They're familiar with the Old Testament. They have all that, uh, you know, that baggage, if you will, of the Old Testament, where the Gentiles who are being grafted in in the first century, you know, coming to Christ, they don't, they don't come with all those things, right? They don't come with a truckload of, you know, sacrificial systems and, you know, temples and tabernacles and Moses, and they don't come with any of that. Uh, and so you can, can say, certainly this isn't a, a true statement that they that's easier for them to come to Christ because we know it's the same way for everyone to come to Christ. But if you understand kind of the, the human sense that they don't have all this stuff, you know, as they're coming to Christ. But certainly Christ is capable of taking care of all your stuff. None of that matters. <laughs> uh, if, if you're called to believe in him, you will believe in him. And so... Uh, but you understand the difference, and so he's trying to teach them and train them to show them uh, what's going to be the overarching principle of this entire sermon. That all those things of the Old Testament, what was the purpose? What's the purpose of all those things? Point to Jesus. Go Good. Ahead. Point to Jesus. We're going to get into later into chapters 7 and 8, then 11. It's just going to go on and on and on how he's just going to say, this is all shadow. This is all type. This is all pointing to heavenly things. All these things are pointing, as Pete says, to Jesus. The sacrifices are all about Jesus, right? Isaiah 53. Um, everything that he's talking about is trying to show them that Jesus is better. It's all a picture, in fact, of Jesus, okay? So, so take all the Take all the belief and all the faith and all the confidence you have from Moses and Joshua and the law and angels and all that stuff. And he's saying, take all that from where it's misplaced and put it in Christ where it's supposed to be. And so certainly that's the case for non-believers, but also for believers, right? And I think that's probably applicable for us here tonight to say... You know, what are things, traditions, what are, are things that you grew up in with your culture? What are things that you're holding on to that really aren't important and really aren't significant and are perhaps holding you back from, you know, maturing in, in, into Christ more? And so you might have some of these things holding you back and say to take those things and place your faith where it should be. Because the, the Hebrews were trained to expect the Messiah. To expect who he's preaching, but they Good. they've been spent their whole lives being taught he wasn't going to be anything like right what Jesus was like. That's right. That's right. Good. Good point. Okay. Good. So let's uh, let's go ahead and pick up now in verse eleven, and uh, we're going to go through the end of the chapter. So to verse sixteen, who can uh, who can grab that and read those? verses for us. How many is that? Seven? Who, who can handle seven verses nice and loud for us? Thanks, George. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following, following their example of disobedience. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, mm. joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. How far do you want me to go? I'll go to the end if you would. Oh, okay. Thank you. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is un unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Amen. Praise the Lord. Father God, thank you for this text. Thank you for this evening. Uh, thank you for your spirit. We ask, as always, that your spirit will be our guide and our teacher. Lord, that you would illumine our minds to the things that you have for us to understand tonight. And... Um, 
as your word says, to come boldly uh, with confidence. We, we draw before the throne of grace to ask for grace from you and mercy from you in our time of need. And we certainly all have many needs. And so, God, we just thank you for being the one who provides for those needs. And uh, ultimately, uh, for our ultimate need, which is forgiveness of our sins, which comes through Jesus, who loved us and gave himself for us. We pray in his name tonight. Amen. Amen. One small yes, sir. observation about yeah. the author of Hebrews. Okay? Good. So verse 12 talks about the word of God as a double-edged sword. Okay? Yeah. And that's right back to the armor of God in Ephesians 6.13. It could be Paul. Possibly. Yeah, po possibly. And I think, I don't know if you were, were, were you with us at the beginning uh, intros when we started talking about, you know, who possibilities are. So sure, certainly Paul is on the, the list. Um, I'm just trying to find where I was now to kind of just to, to re, rebut you, Dave, just to have fun with it. Okay. Um, because because it's certainly it's a good camp and it may be him. But uh, where is it? Um, because there's this verse that just threw me years ago to say, yeah, I don't think it's Paul. And certainly stylistically we see some similarities with Paul, but... Many other places, it just seems much different than his style. But anyways, it's a rabbit trail we don't need to get on. But it's in chapter 2 right here. And so it says, how shall, in that warning, oh, hold on, I got Greg coming in. Uh, in that first warning, he says, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. Uh, and bore witness. And so the, the, the those who heard and bore witness, I would say, are the apostles. And the apostles are the ones who told these people about uh, Jesus and about the gospel. And the writer puts himself in that group, saying the apostles told us, and kind of includes himself in there. So just food for thought, because I think your your statement about the sword and, and parallel is good food for thought, too. So uh, I, I think that's just interesting, good stuff, because it certainly is uh, a good point about the you know, the armor and the swords, which uh, is is great talk, right? Because we know we're in a battle, and, and that's why we see this a lot. It's a one weapon, right? That's right, Ken. That's right. The offensive, right? We have the offensive with the word. Amen. So he's now in this, uh, as we said, he's summing up in verse 11 this, this second warning, uh, you know, that you will not fall into disobedience, you know, enter into the rest of Christ. And so now he's going to transition into... Our next, uh, our next thing, you know, to see that he speaks to Jesus being superior. And he's going to say how Jesus is uh, our great high priest. He is the great high priest. And he's going to unpack this in the uh, next couple chapters, chapters 5 through 7. We're going to see this a lot. And then even past that, uh, this is going to be a theme that we're going to see throughout Hebrews about the high priest. And, and that Jesus is superior to all other high priests. Um, Oh, see if my clicker will go here. There it goes. And uh, and again, we've seen this. Actually, look back in chapter 2. We've seen this already one time. Um, chapter 2, verse 17. He says, Therefore he, uh, Jesus, had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest and the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Okay, so that's, again, that's kind of the start of what he's going to unpack a little bit more here tonight and moving forward in the next couple chapters. Okay, so um, we are told to be diligent to enter that rest in verse 11. Because, or in verse 12, most versions start with the word for, right? We we'll always put a significance on those conjunctions. And he's saying for, why? He's saying because of what I just said in verse 11. The word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Well, that's a lot right there in that verse. Okay, so we're going uh, we're gonna to park on that and unpack this for a little bit. So what we see here is, and we'll get to certainly all the implications that Dave and I were just talking about uh, of the word of God. But we see in this context this judicial power, if you will, of God's word. Uh, that it has the power to uh, damn people as it did the unbelieving Israelites in, in the wilderness. Okay, And it kept them from entering the promised land because of unbelief. Why? Because 
they heard the word of God, they heard the truth of God, and they rejected it, right? They denied. And so they were uh, unbelieving, and therefore they were punished, and they, they fell in the wilderness, okay? Um, so it also has the ability and will judge uh, and condemn in the same way every single person who does not believe in Jesus Christ. And so we understand that that is a truth of, of the gospel, that is a truth of the Bible, uh, right? That there's only one way, right? There's only one way. John 14, Jesus says, uh, verse 6, I am the way, okay? So uh, there's not multiple ways, there's only one way, and if you don't take the way, that means you're not going. You're not going to enter into that rest. Remember Matthew uh, 7, um, narrow is the way, right? Narrow is the path that leads to the straight way, and wide is the path to what? To destruction, okay? Uh, and it says many will enter it, and few will enter the narrow gate. So uh, we understand there's only two paths, right? There's only two paths, and the only way to get through the narrow gate into to eternal life is through Jesus Christ, okay? So we know the Word of God because we've already quoted and talked about Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of Christ, hearing the gospel is how people are saved. So the Word of God... <clears throat> Is, is very active in this, okay? And it says it is living. Um, some versions, I think the King James says quick, right? And so uh, quickening means to come to life, right? The, if you've heard that saying of uh, the quick and the dead, I think there's a Western, right? There's a Western movie called that, the quick and the dead. What does that mean? That means the living and the dead, right? Um, so the, the word of God is living, okay? It has this living power. Uh, well, why does it have living power? Why would we say that? Why, why would I say that it has living power, you guys? We're, we're amongst, uh, you know, a lot of believers here. You guys should should know what that means. What do we mean that the, 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 the word has living power? That's how we saved. Huh? That's how we saved. Okay. Good. Good. It addresses the, the, the needs of all people. Um, it, it's not particular to... Individual circumstances or individual people, it, it has it, it has meaning to everybody. Mm -hmm. Good. It gives new life. Ah. It gives new life. Yeah, it gives life, right? Uh, but it is a living thing, right? It is as we're reading this letter. Uh, and I pray in the, the few months that we've been here now in, in the first four chapters that uh, we've found edification, we've found sanctification, we've found application uh, in our studies of this of this letter. And this is, you know, nearly 2,000 years after this letter was written. So it was written to a context to people in the first century and given to them, and yet we still have application and learning and growth from it now some 1,900 and something years later. Uh, do you see it? Because God's word is amazing. Because it is living. It is active. Uh, it is like like um, Rob was saying. It's applicable, uh, right? It doesn't matter if it was two thousand years ago or today, uh, or however long you know till till the Lord tarries. However much longer this this earth lasts, uh, it is always going to be applicable. It is always going to be uh, truth because it's living and it is active. Um, it's the breath, if you will, of the living God. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, uh, most of us probably have that one, um, have heard it often. Anybody have that memorized? Know what it is? Or, or we can certainly turn there. 2 Timothy 3.16. Jay, I'll put you on the spot. I know you know it. Um, all scripture is inspired by God, profitable Good. for doctrine, reproof, correction. <clears throat> Yep, and instruction and all righteousness. That was right on. Thank you. Bam! See, I'm just going to put people on the spot. They know. You guys know. Yeah, so uh, the Word of God is is living, right? It's breathing. As, as Jay just said, all Scripture, Paul writes to Timothy, all Scripture is God-breathed, okay? It's inspired by God, depending on the version you have. But the, the original behind that means it's breathed. It's, it's the breath of God. And it's not even uh, inhaling. Okay, it's exhaling. It's coming out when you breathe out. When you speak, you breathe out. And that's the understanding of what 2 Timothy 3.16 means, is that God is breathing out his truth and his word. Uh, that all scripture has come from the mouth of God and from the breath and the words of God. Okay, so, uh, so it's Hebrews is in this book, so we believe it is inspired by the Holy Spirit, right? It is God-breathed.
Okay. Good. Uh, so that's what it means to be living. We're just going to pick apart each one of these uh, adjectives and these words here in this sentence. Uh, the word of God is living. It says and active. Uh, so it is active, meaning it is powerful. Um, I put it's effectual. Maybe you have some other synonyms for, for those words. Uh, those are synonyms, not cinnamon. Um, but effectual, right? That, that God's word is effectual. It is active. It is powerful. It is able, as we're going to move forward, to do exactly what God wants it to do. Uh, we know that Isaiah 55 says that God's word does not return void, right? It always, always, always accomplishes what God has set for it to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Our teaching and proclamation and t discussion around God's word tonight will accomplish exactly what he ordained before the foundation of the world to happen here tonight in this room and on this computer. Do you understand that? That's that's the sovereignty of God. That's the awesomeness of blow your mind how awesome God is. Okay? Uh, so exactly what he wants it to do, it will do. Okay? We're to be faithful, right, in, in studying it and talking about it and memorizing it and doing those things because it is to be everything for us. Look, for, for believers, God's word is the ultimate authority. This is the final authority for the church. This is the final authority for you in your life as a believer. Everybody understand that? That's why it's so vital. That's why it's so important. Uh, that's why we stress around here so much to read the Bible, to study the Bible, not just come here and be filled by me or, or Pastor Brian or Pastor Steve. Study on your own. You, you must be eating the Word. You must be reading the Word. You must be memorizing the Word. Uh, that's what believers need to do uh, because it's so vital to us. Okay, Okay. so it's sharp. Let's, uh, let's talk about that a little bit. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Uh, and, and the thought behind this is actually that it is, uh, it doesn't have to be swung on multiple times, right? If you've ever seen like a uh, fisherman, you ever get like a dull knife and you try to fillet a fish, how's that, how's that work, right? Or you try, to, you try to beat something, try to stab something with something that you think is sharp, but it's not. Uh, it puts a lot more work on you, right? Even a shovel, like if it's dull and you're trying to shovel outside, it's like so much work. Now you get a, a big sharp tool, right? You get a sharp sword, you get a sharp knife, it's like psh, butter, right? Butter. Um, and that's the idea behind uh, it is sharper, meaning it is is able to pierce at ease. Uh, it's the hot knife through butter, right? It's just, psh, it's, it's nothing. Because for God, it's nothing to use his word to change someone's heart and to save them. It's nothing, no big deal at all. Uh, it's nothing for God to use his word to influence a believer to say, yep, it's no big deal for you to stop that drinking thing. Uh, well, you can take care of that right here. Uh, he can give you the power through the Holy Spirit and through the truth of the word and do whatever he wants to. Uh, it's easy. It's easy for him. Okay, this thing is sharp. It's not just sharp on one side. It's double-edged. Okay, uh, and so we'll get to that here in a moment. But this sharper, it talks of um, separating joints and marrow. And it says, even dividing or the division of the soul and spirit. Well, those are some pretty significant things. Uh, I, I didn't have this in the notes. don't want to talk about it too much. But um, there is this thought of, so we're on the upper shelf now, um, dipping our toes in the deep end of the pool conversation for a couple minutes. Uh, but you guys know we're not scared to do that. Uh, there's this thought uh, uh, amongst theologians and amongst preachers and pastors and churches of, uh, what's called a dichotomy or a trichotomy of the human state. And so that means, uh, do you believe that there's three, meaning there's body, soul, and spirit? Or is there just two, meaning body and soul slash spirit? Uh, and so perhaps you've heard that debate or discussion or you have some insight on it. Perhaps you don't, and that's okay. We're not going to do that tonight. The point is, I don't think that this is the intent of the writer. Uh, I don't think it is saying here that it's dividing the soul and spirit, meaning, oh, it's definitely a trichotomy because he says soul and spirit. Uh, I can show you many other places where soul and spirit are used interchangeably, saying soul is spirit, spirit is soul. Uh, so I would personally lean towards two and that there's a body and a soul, which is the spirit and is the same thing. What I believe he's going to, and, and, and reassurance of this is that he says, dividing joints and marrow. Do we have any, like, doctors in here? Anybody can tell us? What is that? What's joints? What's the marrow? What does that look like? George usually has insight to these kinds of things. What does that mean? Marrow is the inside of the bone. It's like a softer tissue than the bone. 
Okay, so marrow is the soft, in, like, it's like here's the, the joint is the outside, and actually the bone, and this is the point of why I think he's not talking about this, because he doesn't say it's the separation of bone and marrow. He says it's the separation of joint and marrow. The marrow is a soft underlining, and the joints where, you know, say your, your two joints come together, and that marrow is a soft thing underneath. It's not talking about the bone and the marrow being separated. It's talking about things that really aren't separable. Do you understand? He's saying God's word is able to separate even the inseparable. He, he's saying it can do whatever he wants to do with his word. That it is so uh, sharp that, again, it's double-sided, is double-edged, and can divide even things where you don't think they can be divided. So with that thought in mind, this double edge, this division that happens, do you see the do you see the avenue? Do you see what he's trying to draw us to? We have two edges. One edge is for convicting and converting people, right? Those who will believe. The other edge is for condemning those who do not believe. And so in that, uh, you can write this down for the sake of time. We won't turn there, but first Corinthians 118. Uh, is where Paul says, uh, for the, the word of God, uh, right, the, 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 the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. And he says, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Right? That's the word of the cross. That's, what are we talking about? The word of the cross. It's the preaching of the gospel. And so he's saying, it is foolishness to all those who do not believe. And Paul says that many times, that uh, we preach the, you know, that we are folly, and, and people think we are fools because of what we speak of this Jesus. Well, he says, but to those who are being saved, it's the power of God. Meaning what? It's the power of God to bring you unto salvation. So, double edge means this thing strikes, and it converts some, and it condemns others, which is many, right? The few and the many of the two paths that we talked about a little bit earlier. So, um, thoughts on that so far before we continue on. What do you guys got? Comments? Inputs? Does that, uh, does that make sense? Does that jive? Yeah, we got it down pat. Makes sense, right? And, and certainly most of you guys are, are around here and we speak to these things often. So, um, I pray that we really do have it down pat. Right? That's the key, is uh, this is what God's Word does. It is, remember guys, the message of the, of the gospel is offensive. Right? The Bible says it's offensive. Jesus says to his disciples as he's, remember he's feeding, I think it's John 6, he's feeding the, uh, the 5,000, he's feeding the people, and, and then after that they're saying, he's saying, you must eat my body and drink my blood to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And the disciples come to him and say, man, this, this thing you're saying is so hard. And he says to them, he says, does this offend you? And he says, so be it. And it says after that, a couple of verses after that, it says many of those followers stopped following him. You see it? He intentionally did these things. He intentionally, purposely did these things to weed out the weed and the tares all the time. With the parables, he says the same thing. He, they, say, they ask him, why do you preach in parables? Why do you teach in, in parables? Tell us, Pete. Why, why did Jesus teach in parables? Well, so that the people he intended to learn from it could understand it, but the people who thought they were so smart couldn't figure it out. It was like it That's out. right. Because, again, as he spoke the words on some of the hearts, they totally understood what he was saying, right? To the ones that he revealed it to. To the others that he did not reveal it to, they had no clue what he was talking about. And so they didn't follow, and they did. Why? Because one group believes, and one group does not believe. And that's, again, just the, the separation of the two groups of people that we see uh, from, from the time Adam sent, right? From, fall, from the fall in Genesis chapter 3. That's all of humanity is lumped into two groups, and that's it, right? It's not race. It's not ethnicity. It's not multiple colors. We're all one race. We're all from Adam and Eve, okay? Post-flood, we're all from Noah and his family. It's all one human race. It's all one big family. The difference is you have believers and non-believers, right? That's what it all boils down to. No. The apostles didn't understand most of his... That's right. 
which is why they always that's a great point rob and so what what always happened because a lot of times the disciples didn't know and so what did he do that's right he pulled them off to the side they would sometimes come and ask what did that what did the parable of that mean and sometimes he would just take them and once once they were out of the group that he told everybody he would come to the side and he would tell them and explain to them this is what this means and this is what the the harvest is at the end of the age and he tells them things because to your point they still didn't understand right we see that they weren't even believers in, in the gospel till like after he rose from the dead <laughs> so that's right so yeah so um, good point good point okay so the word is a sword uh, i've got some scriptures here maybe we can pass them out and, and run around the room real quick uh, Rob, would you mind getting the first one there? Revelation, actually all those, since you'll be right there in the book of Revelation. There's three of them there. And um, Jay, would you mind getting Ephesians 6, 17? Should make Dave get that. He already brought it up. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we see uh, the scripture, right, is what we're talking about. The word, the word of God is the scriptures, right? Remember how this letter opened? The book of Hebrews opens with the writer saying how... Through various ways and various times, right, God chose to reveal himself to men. Remember the prophets uh, and then to the apostles. And he says, now in these last days, he's chosen to reveal himself to us by Jesus. So Jesus is the word and we have the completed word of God. And so that's what we have here. And so God's word is, is this sort. Okay, Rob, ready? Yeah. Uh, Revelation 1.16. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. Okay, so that's the beginning of the book of Revelation. That is Jesus giving this revelation to John, uh, the apostle. And that's John writing a description of what Jesus looks like is what he's starting there. And he says right there that he has what coming out of his mouth? A double-edged sword. Isn't that what we see right here? Uh, in, in the thing. So, so hey, Dave, there's an interesting conversation for us right there. There's John, right, writing Revelation, saying the same thing as, as this book. Um, next one, okay. 2.12. To the angel of the church of Pergamum write, these are the words of him who has a sharp, double-edged sword. Again, seven letters to seven churches from Jesus, and he says this is from him who has this sharp, double-edged sword. Uh, it's speaking, right? Coming from his mouth. So what is that talking about? His word is this sword. Verse 16. Repent, therefore. Otherwise, I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. There you go. So repent or else what? The sword of my mouth is coming against you. Okay, so again, we see we see the idea of the sword. Uh, Jay, I think uh, Ephesians 6, you have that right? And that's yeah. this... That's this uh, description that Dave was alluding to from Ephesians 6 of the, you know, put on the whole armor of God, right? And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Okay, so there you go. And that's, again, our one offensive. We have shields, we have helmets, we have all these things that he talks about. And then he says, pick up the sword. Uh, so that's our offensive. And also, sword is defensive, yes, right? Sword fighting. Um but he's saying the sword is the word of God, right? So we don't have to worry and debate about what the sword is. Uh, God's word tells us what the sword is, okay? In all these places that we look so far, and probably others that, that you may know and could add to. Uh, these are just ones that, that I found and, and thought of in my studies. Okay, so this is the power, you guys, of God's word is living, is active, is sharper than any two-edged sword. Because God knows man. Um, and is able to condemn him or convert him by the truth of his word. Discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Isn't that what it means? Yep, God knows the intentions of your heart. God knows uh, man's heart. And in fact, he knows it so well and knows how deceitful and evil and wicked it is that he talks about how you must be given a new heart how in fact he must give you a new heart ezekiel 36 i must remove the heart of stone and give you a new heart of flesh uh jeremiah even 31 writing the laws on their hearts giving them new hearts 
uh, God has to give you a new heart in order to regenerate you, in order to change you and to change your will into obeying him and to, to believing in him, okay? So, of course, God knows the intentions of our hearts, right? He, he gave us our hearts. He, he created us. Okay, uh, next verse says, There is no creature hidden from God's sight. Well, that kind of goes with what I was just saying about us and our hearts. God knows us because he created us. Uh, so certainly there's nothing hidden from him, but rather all things are open, says in verse 13, and laid bare to his eyes. So God knows everything. Uh, there's nothing so deep in man's heart that God can't draw it out, right? Um, this isn't the depths of the ocean to which we can't reach, right? This is God can reach uh, all fathoms. He can get everywhere uh, into man's heart and to draw it out uh, through the power of his word. Okay, his word reveals the truth. His word saves us. Uh, man is laid bare before him, it says. That means exposed. I don't know if any versions say the word exposed. Uh, my NASB didn't. Actually, it does say here in the ESV. No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So this idea here behind he is laid bare, this is actually the thought of somebody being executed. This is actually the thought of taking somebody's head and leaning their head back and exposing their neck for execution. That's what this is in context this is what this language means to be laid bare before god means we're laying you bare and exposing your neck for the executioner to finish you right now uh, and that's what lay bare means so it's saying that god's word lays bare the heart of man and lays bare men meaning you are exposed and wide open and have no defense and can do nothing uh, because god's word has you and it's true Comments, thoughts? I remind me of garden with um, Adam and Eve hiding, you know, the, the, oh. because they were naked and it's, it's, it was the same thing, you know, like as if, as if you can't see, you just know, you know. Yeah, so yeah. good point, uh, Pete. Yeah, in Genesis 3 there, Adam and Eve sin. Yeah, and I, I find that whole exchange there just comedic, well, personally. Well. <laughs> uh, certainly not the fall of sin and, and the, the consequences of it, but yeah, just, uh, just how God just exposes them by asking questions right steve you must you must really enjoy that part <laughs> as he says adam where are you like he doesn't know where he is like adam where are you no that's no he knows where you are <laughs> um yep so uh good good point yeah we are exposed we are naked so that's a good sight to think of adam and eve in that original sin right and the shame and the ex exposing of themselves, um, you know, certainly in the, we think of the nakedness, but exposing themselves to God now as a sinner, right? That we are now exposed in our sin for who we are. And now we've been alienated and we've broken this relationship that we had with the creator God. So we are exposed. Okay, so God's word opens uh, eyes to see. Uh, this this truth, the light of his truth. Um, let's turn, everybody turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, please. What's that referring to in Hebrews? I'm the, sorry, where are we at? His, his word opens eyes to see the light of truth. What? Yes, uh, no, I'm just piggybacking off um, being laid bare. That we're being laid bare and we're exposed and that God's word uh, brings the truth. And so going back to kind of the, the principle of the two-edged sword that okay. the either condemns or converts, and I'm just going on to, uh, you know, saying that the Word of God, when it converts someone, uh, you know, opens their eyes to the light of the truth, you know, to, to the truth of the gospel. So turn over to the right couple books, and you got First Peter chapter 2, uh, verse 9. says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his, God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
So it's him who called you, okay? God called you out of this darkness and into his marvelous light. And so he enlightens and illumines people's minds to the truth of the gospel, right? That's what we're talking about. What is, what is this darkness? It's saying he's called you out of the darkness. What is that darkness? Good. Your, your unbelief, right? You are in unbelief and you are in your sin. And you are in complete darkness, and your eyes are closed to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Until God drags you out of that darkness, opens your eyes, and reveals the light of truth to you. That's what Peter's saying. That's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. And that's what James says. James 1, uh, verse 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Okay? So there's, there's a, a name for God, and in, in he's calling him the Father of lights. And why? Because he is the Father of all light, right? He is the one who illumines uh, our minds and, and exposes uh, us to the light of, of truth and to the light of the gospel. Okay, so back to Hebrews uh, chapter 4, and let's move on to verse 14. And because we are laid bare before God, we must give an account to him. So before we go to 14, look at the end of 13, right? It says, well, we are laid bare and we are naked and exposed to him whom we must give account. Referring to the judgment day, right? That's coming for all. So if we are not in Christ, that judgment day will be judged upon our works. And we know that every single person... If you're judged on your works, you're condemned because the Bible is clear. You cannot earn your way to heaven. There are no good works. There are no good deeds uh, that you can do to shift the balance in your in your favor, if you will, to earn God's favor and say, well, if, if I'm just good enough, maybe I'll just make the curve. You know, if that guy's making it, I know I'm making it. Um, you know, that's just not the case uh, because it's not by works. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, right? Um you know, for by grace have you been saved, through faith. That uh, is a gift from God and not of yourself, right? And why? So that no one can boast. There's nothing you did or contributed to it. So therefore, you must give an account to God for that. If you're not a believer, you're going to pay uh, and, and make account for, for that. And anyway, I think we talked about this a little bit last week or perhaps the prior week in Romans 1. How it talks about how creation reveals God. Through all creation, every single person on the planet who's ever been born to see creation knows that there is a creator. Uh, you know when there's a painting, there's a painter. Uh, there's a building, there's a builder. People can look at creation and God is revealed in creation. And so right there in Romans 1 it says, so they are without excuse. Without excuse for what? For that day, that judgment day that's coming. You're without excuse because you've seen it and I've, I've put enough evidence out there for every single person to know that there is a God and you're you have no excuse you're going to be accountable so believe in Jesus Christ because it's not enough to just believe yep I see creation I believe there's a higher power or there's a God uh, that's not saving faith okay saving faith comes from believing who this God is and the word of God says the God who created all creation is Jesus who also came and laid down his life on the cross and shed his blood for all those who will believe in him. Okay, that's the God we're talking about. So we have to certainly define that and, and believe in Jesus Christ. So uh, because of this, though, that we must give this account and all these things that are happening that we are not hidden, uh, this should draw us to that merciful and faithful high priest that we already talked about a little bit in chapter 2 for a couple verses. And now uh, we see in verse 14, uh, since then we have a great high priest. So again, he's urging people, consider Jesus, right? Here it is again. Come to Jesus, believe in Jesus, uh, and that's always what we're trying to do, right? That's what I'm trying, in fact, to do here tonight. Uh, so as verse, verse 14 continues, we have a high priest who passed through the heavens, and that's Jesus, the Son of God. So this Jesus that we've been talking about, this Jesus the writer of Hebrews has been talking about, the one who is great, right? Well, the one who's greater than the angels. He's greater than uh, the law. The one who's greater than Moses. 
uh, and Joshua. That Jesus, who is the Son of God. You see it right there in verse 14? It says it clearly. Jesus is the Son of God. He is also our high priest, and therefore greater than any other high priest. And so now pointing back again to our Hebrew brethren, right in the context of this, that would be a big deal, right? The high priest, because the high priest was part of that uh, Old Testament system and the sacrificial system, and the high priest would be, and there were many priests and Levites and those who served in the temple and, and did God's work, uh, but the high priest was, you know, the main guy. Uh, if you remember, like Caiaphas was, was the high priest uh, in Jesus' time. And so, um, you know, he was the one who once a year, Day of Atonement, would go into the, he would go into the temple and he would go into the Holy of Holies, which was a little, a smaller room that was back in, in the temple that only the high priest could go into. And he would go in there to make sacrifices, to make offerings for the sins of the people. You see it? The sins to atone for the people's sins. And we'll unpack that a lot more in future chapters. But um, that's the duty of the high priest, is to kind of mediate, right? To, to intercede for the people to God, right? That was the job of the high priest. He was that mediator, and he, he was that person who did that. Okay, so that's where he's going now with this picture. That's, that would be in the Hebrews understanding, and now he's going to say, yeah, let's talk about that high priest. Let's, let's talk about that system and, and how that points to Jesus. And even in this verse, look at it. The, we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens. Um, so I've got a little word off on the side there in the notes that says veil. Because that's the picture. That's the picture you see, that you see here. He passed through the heavens. The same way that a high priest in a temple, there was a veil between uh, a curtain between the, the rest of the temple and then the Holy of Holies, where only the high priest could go through that curtain, and that was called the veil. When Jesus died on the cross, what happened to that veil? It was torn in two from the top to the bottom, showing and symbolizing, yep, there's no need for high priest anymore. You don't need this veil. You don't need this temple. You don't need no high priest. Why? Because I'm the high priest. I'm the temple. I'm the propitiation. I'm the everything you everything you've been taught is all about me. Uh, and so that's the significance of the, the tearing of the veil. So as he's passing through the heavens, even this imagery of passing through the veil, and he is now in heaven, uh, in God's presence, which was the idea behind the high priest going into the curtain behind the veil. He was going into the Holy Holies where he was meeting with God. And just like in the Old Testament, uh, you know, God, we understand, is everywhere, right? Uh, he doesn't need a house to, to dwell in. He doesn't need any of those things, but it was, again, symbolic. And so he told Moses, you know, he would meet with the people in the tabernacle, and the smoke of the glory, uh, kind of glory of God would fill the, the room and fill the temples. Uh, and so God said, remember the Ark of the Covenant, and make the cherubim on top with the mercy seat on top of the covenant, and I will meet there with you. He says, so he's pointing to the presence of God, to the presence of God. And so the people would get that through the high priest going through the veil and being in God's presence. So we have Jesus going through the heavens and that heavens means what? See how that says S on it? Heavens plural. So what's that referring to? What's that talking to? Some of our uh, scholars that we got in here and we talked about it in Genesis some. Uh, I know it's been several months since... Uh, Genesis 1, but what is that talking about? Why does it say heavens, plural? Passing through all three heavens, the, the immediate heaven, mm -hmm. the, the universal heaven, and then... Good. The, so what is this immediate heaven? heaven? Yeah, that's, that's our atmosphere. That's Good. the sky. Yes. So the heavens, remember, uh, the heavens declare your glory. And as you go through Psalms, you see uh, the birds fly in the heavens. Okay? That means in the sky, in our atmosphere that we can see. That's kind of the first heaven. Then there's the second heaven that Rob's referring to, which is outer space in the atmosphere. That's the second heaven. And the third heaven would be out beyond the universe, you know, kind of God's abode, if you will. Uh, and so it's saying Jesus passed through these heavens. So what's that referring to? His ascension. Good. His ascension, right? He ascended. Uh, after three days, he rose from the grave. He was on earth 40 days, right? And then he ascended, and he went up into the heavens, and, and it says that they beheld him, that they saw him ascend into the heavens until he disappeared in the, in the clouds. So he ascended and went through the heavens, through the veil. He's now in heaven in God's presence. Uh, and after defeating 
death and sin through his resurrection, uh, which we already talked about in chapter 2, as it says there, actually if you look back, chapter 2, verse 18, says that he is our merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. So somebody remind me what that means. What is this word propitiation? What does that mean? Payment. Sorry? Payment. Payment? Good. Awesome. <coughs> yep. And, and, and to a little more um, appropriate refined, good, would be like um, appropriate payment is good, but satisfactory payment, sufficient, as we talk about the, the letter of Hebrews is about the sufficiency of Christ. It's the sufficiency of payment. Uh, paid in full. Nothing owed. Uh, it's it's finished. It's done with. And so that propitiation, it says he made the propitiation, is what it says there in chapter 2. The high priest would make the propitiation, which is what? The sacrifices, the offering, which atoned for uh, the people's sins. And so we know, again, that, that they had to keep sacrificing, keep sacrificing, right, over and over and over, because they had to continue to do that, because that was a picture of Jesus Christ who is making, as the high priest, he's making the propitiation on behalf of the people, and he is the propitiation, right? Because he is the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world, it says in Revelation, and who John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, right? Isaiah 53, uh, the Lamb of God, that's who we're talking about, is Jesus. So he made the propitiation as the high priest, and he is the propitiation because... He is the sacrifice, right, that all those sacrifices pointed to. And, and again, in future chapters, in chapter 9 and 10, uh, it's going to unpack that for us more on why they had to continue to kill all these animals and why we don't anymore and, and what all that looks like. And in short, right, Cliff Notes version is the sins uh, of men were never covered by, uh, by the blood of, of bulls and goats, is what he says. The blood of bulls and goats do not atone for sin. It's all a picture of Jesus Christ. <coughs> offering himself whose blood does atone and cover sins okay so he laid down his life as as paul says once for all right one time for all believers for all sin for all who believe okay so this rest that he's talking about moses couldn't give it joshua couldn't give it moses didn't even enter the promised land himself right but joshua did but neither one of them can give this rest no high priest, no earthly man high priest could ever offer this rest and give it either. Only Jesus can give us this eternal rest, right? It's only in Christ and by faith in him that we can have this eternal rest and enter into his rest. So Jesus is our merciful and faithful high priest uh, who made propitiation. And again, he is that propitiation. He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. And he sits at the right hand of the Father, right? And there's, there's the gospel. He lived a perfect life. He laid down his life on the cross. He was raised from the dead three days later. In fact, you know, the Bible also says he raised himself from the dead. He said, I am able to lay down my life, and I'm also able to pick it up. He raised from the dead, showing that he was the propitiation and validating that what he said was true, that he defeated death, he defeated sin. And now he sits at the right hand of the Father. What is he doing now? Why is at the right hand of the Father? Is, is Jesus's, as we talked about last week in kind of a different context, right, Rob, to say Jesus's work at, this, at that stage, right, is finished, as he says, it is finished. But he's still ministering, right? He's still working on our behalf because what is he doing there? What is he doing at the right hand of the Father? Anybody know? Well, let's look at it. He's ministering um, as that great and faithful high priest. Let's look at some of this. It, like I said, it's all throughout this letter. Uh, look at chapter 7. Flip forward to chapter 7. Let's look at verse 26. And actually, I want to go back to verse... 25. Actually, just for a little bit of context what we talked about, let's go to 23. The former priests, meaning all the earthly priests, high priests, 
were many in number because they were prevented by death from a continuing office. But he, being Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Right? Jesus is alive for, forever. Right? Amen? But, verse 24, he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Verse 25, consequently, he is able to save the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, meaning those who have been saved by him, through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. You hear that? Always making intercession for them. Uh, look at verse 26. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, and unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. That's our high priest. That's Jesus. He is interceding and making intercessions on our behalf. Look at chapter 8, verse 1. Now the point in what we are saying is this. So here we are in chapter 8, still talking about, about this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. There you go. What's he doing at the right hand of the Father? He's interceding. He's continuing to be our high priest and intercede for us. He made the sacrifice for us. We believe in him. We have eternal life. And he's still there interceding for us as we do what? Continue to sin. Right? We continue to sin. And, and Satan... Uh, Revelation talks about him accusing the brethren day and night before the throne of God. Jesus is sitting right there. Go back to the courtroom scene. It's almost like that. Jesus is sitting right there. Every accusation that Satan makes, he says, yep, that's already covered. Yep, I've already forgiven that. Yep, I've already covered that one. Yep, I know Shannon's still a sinner. He's covered by the blood of Christ. And I intercede for him, and he's saved because of my sacrifice. His sins are forgiven. Praise God. That's, that's what he's done. That's what he does. That's who he is. Ver, uh, chapter 9. A couple more here. Chapter 9. Verse 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered into the holy place. It talks about it. It's continuing. That's where it talks about the blood of, of bulls and goats and all, all those things. But Christ appeared, and he is the great high priest. Uh, look at verse 24. For Christ has entered, not into holy places made with hands, talking about that veil, okay, talking about the holy of holies in the temple, which there is no more. Why is there no temple anymore? Because there's no need for a temple anymore, right? Well, who's the temple now? Believers of the temple, right? The Holy Spirit. And uh, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 6, uh, don't you know that you were purchased with a price and that you are the temple of the Holy God, right? He indwells with us. Uh, so where was that? Verse 24. Christ has also entered not in the holy place made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. See what it just said? They were pictures of heavenly things. The altar. When you go to Revelation, you actually see in seal 5, I believe it is, uh, John looks and it says, I saw the souls of the martyrs under the altar in heaven. The altar, the tabernacle, the temple, the sacrifices, the high priest, everything that's in the Old Testament is a picture of heavenly things and of heavenly truths. All pointing to the truth, which is Jesus Christ and salvation in him. Right? He is the sacrifice. He is the high priest. He is all those things. So he is our mediator. Got a few more minutes here. Let's, uh, let's flip back to Job chapter 9. Let's go Old Testament. Job chapter 9. So plop your Bible. Psalms probably. And uh, then you just turn to the right. You got Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Where'd I go? So I meant plop to the left. I said right. Sorry. Going the, I'm going the wrong direction. Find Psalm, go left. All right. Psalm, uh, excuse me, Job 9, 33. This is fascinating to me, uh, which is why I put it in here, just to say he is our mediator. Job is, is perceived by most scholars to be the oldest book the first written book in the Bible, okay? 
Um, we're not exactly sure when Job lived. Uh, believed to be in the time of the patriarchs because of information we get in, in the book of Job. If you're not familiar with the story of Job, you should definitely read this book. Um, it's certainly going to be applicable to you at some point in your life, I'm sure, and encouraging uh, to, to you at any point in your life. Uh, but we believe he lived in the time of the patriarchs, would be, which would be like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, somewhere in that time frame. And look at what he says here. So we're talking a long time ago. Old Testament, Old Testament, right? We're talking about 2,000 years from here back to Christ and another 2,000 years back to Abraham. We're talking 4,000 years ago, okay? 2,000 years before Jesus was even born, okay? Somewhere in that ballpark. Look at what he says here. He has lost, as you know, most of you know the story, he's lost pretty much everything in his life. He has these three friends who aren't really good friends who just keep bringing him down and, and coming at him very hard. And he says, look at verse 33, there is no arbiter or mediator between us. His cases, he's talking about between him and God, who might lay his hand on both of us. He's saying, if only there were a mediator between God and man. If only there was someone to intercede between God and man, because he's so holy, I can't do anything. I, I can't do it. And that's the whole premise of the, the Old Testament system, that the high priest would have to first make atonement for his sins so he could enter into God's presence to make sin uh, to make uh, sacrifices on behalf of the people and so there is this one who intercedes between man and God and again this is all a picture do, do we see it we see the big overall theme it's all a picture to say Jesus is this arbiter Jesus is the mediator Jesus is the one interceding on behalf of man and God because without Jesus you guys we're alienated from God. There's no relationship. There's no nothing with God. It's only through Jesus Christ that that is possible. If he doesn't do what he does, everyone's damned for eternity in hell away from God. You guys, right? Does that make sense? We get the uh, gravity of that. With no Jesus, there's no salvation. With what Jesus did on, on Golgotha at Calvary, there's, there's, without that, there's nothing. That's Paul's whole point in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 about the resurrection and the gospel. If there's no resurrection, there's no none of this. There's no none of this. What I'm doing here tonight is foolishness. It's stupid. It, it, you know, that we are to be pitied for what we're believing and for what we're saying. That men should pity us because we are so hopeless. But we're not. Because he did do it. And because he did raise again. And because he is the mediator. He is the intercessor. We do have hope and assurance in Jesus Christ. And his resur resurrection, his death and resurrection did atone for Job's that's right. years before. That's right. That's right, brother. Good point. So because Jesus died some couple thousand years after Job, right? Uh, remember, everyone, in, everyone in, in the Old Testament, New Testament, everyone since Adam has been saved the same way. It's all by faith. Uh, we've seen that, you know, talking many times um, here, obviously, but uh, preaching through Genesis, same thing as we talk about Abram. You know, we talk about Noah. Uh, so it's a reoccurring theme. Everyone believes in by by faith and is saved. As Abraham it says, believed God, uh, Galatians chapter three, it was imputed to him righteousness. That because he believed by faith, Hebrews uh, talks about um, that as well. That the faith that saved Abraham, um, and that the gospel was preached beforehand. Remember to Abraham. So same thing. Thank you. They didn't know it was Jesus, right? Because it was still future for them. But they believed in the promise of the one to come. And so by faith they believe that just as we do. We just, we're on the other side of the cross. So we look back to know that it was Jesus. And that's what we call him. Good point, Rob. Thank you. So we have this great mediator and high priest. This one who intercedes for us. So verse 14. Uh, bear with me. I'm going to try to get through these last two verses. We've got... Uh, Ah, three minutes, we'll be fine. <laughs> so, uh, we have this great high priest, he says in verse 14, then let us hold fast our confession. So, don't let us falter. Uh, let us not fall into sin. Let us not slip up. And certainly, I understand that's not practical, because we're in our humanity and our flesh, and we will. But let's strive to not do that, right? Let's encourage one another, spur one another on to good things and to do the right things. Uh, Paul says, continue to do the things that you know to do. Peter says, it is good for me to remind you of the things you already know. So that's what I'm doing. 
it's good to remember you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We're going to sin. But we have this assurance in Christ. So uh, do not sin. You know, uh, I think it's James, right, that says uh, be angry and sin not. Don't sin. Uh, so you, you can, in some limited capacity, get better at this, right, and, and control yourself more. Uh, so do that. Uh, be steadfast in the firm. In firm, excuse me, in your faith and your hope uh, and the assurance that we have in Jesus Christ. Because that is the substance of our confession. So as he says, hold fast to that confession. Yep, hold fast and hold tight to that confession because it is what we just laid out. That's what we just talked about for the last 45 minutes uh, is, is Jesus and everything about him. Hold tight to that because that's your confession. For, uh, again here, for or because uh, we do not have a high priest... And, and now be encouraged, believer, here with these last two verses. And certainly 16, most of you, that's a bucket list verse. You should have that memorized by now. If you haven't memorized uh, Hebrews 4.16 just from hearing it so many times from me and Pastor Brian, and even Pastor Steve, uh, you know, <laughs> jumping on that one, that we use this often. Uh, I would say probably in at least half of the prayers that we pray around this place, we use <laughs> chapter 4, verse 16. Uh, as we all should, because this is encouraging. Verse 15 and 16. <clears throat> we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but, or rather, we have one who has been tempted in all things as we are, and yet without sin. Praise God. Because that's what it required. That's, that's what it had to have. God had to have a perfect sacrifice to make propitiation. Right? There couldn't be a blemish. Uh, go back and look at Isaiah 53. Look at the Old Testament laws. Yeah, the sacrifice is the lamb without spot, without blemish, pure. That's none of us. That's no man. So Jesus had to be the one, and he had to do it without sin, or, or it's meaningless. Right? So he did it without sin. Uh, and again, the writer spoke to this in chapter 2, uh, again, in the same context of temptation. But here, he adds that he was tempted... And he did it without sin. A uh, couple verses. Let's flip to it. If you'll bear with me for five more minutes. Matthew 26. If you have to go, I certainly understand. As we are uh, running out of time here. Matthew 26. <clears throat> 36. Verse 36. I'm going to start here. Then Jesus went with them. I, I want to. What I'm trying to get here to you is to show you um, Jesus in his temptation. Because I think we are tempted to think, oh, well, of course Jesus did it because he's God. He's perfect. It was easy for him. Right? Do you understand that, that thought? And perhaps we've entertained those thoughts. Yeah, well, of course he could, he could do it because he's God. So he wasn't truly tempted. So it's not like he really was stronger than I am. He just doesn't understand the temptation because he's not a man. He's God. And so it was easy for him, right? Everybody follow me in that train of thought? Um, in, in Isaiah 53, uh, 3 says um, that he calls him a man of sorrows, okay? And that's, you don't have to look that up. I want to write it down. Isaiah 53, 3 calls him the man of sorrows. Well, what were these sorrows? There were many sorrows because obviously what he had to do in, in, on the cross. Uh, but I want us to look at this specific instance here. This is him on the night of his betrayal. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane and he is now going to pray uh, to God several times here. And, uh, and let's just read this account. Matthew 26, 36 to 44. It says, Then Jesus went with them, his disciples, to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And, and this is in one of the last watches of the night. Uh, this is late, late night. This is somewhere... Uh, probably without thinking about it and looking at notes too much, this is probably somewhere between you know midnight and three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning. Okay, uh, because he's going to be taken after this to these closed door behind closed door trials uh, with Caiaphas and the high priest, and they're going to convict him. They're going to take a pilot first thing in the morning. He's going to end up dying this day. Okay, so he says here, "Sit here while I go over and pray." And taking with him, so he sat the the, the eleven because Judas has left and betrayed him at this time. He sits them down, and it says in verse 37, he takes with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, which are who? James, James, James. Thank you. Peter, James, and John. He began to be sorrowful and troubled. 
Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. I feel so bad right now, and am in such a struggle right now, I want to die, is what Jesus is saying. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, Look at how this prayer is. Look at this, what he's asking. My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but as you will. Or not my will be done, but yours. What is this cup? Jay, tell us, what does this mean that he says, let this cup pass from me? Crucifixion. Huh? Crucifixion. Good, the crucifixion, because this cup is imagery of the cup of the wrath of God that he is going to drink from. Uh, that as he's going to be on the cross, he's going to bear God's wrath for all the sins of anyone who will ever believe in him. So, in that moment, again, uh, Jesus is going to be looked on by God as the most sinful person who ever lived. Okay? That's remarkable. So, that's what he's talking about here. Verse 40. He came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So you cannot even watch with me for an hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Well, that's pretty interesting. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Can I get an amen? amen. Verse 42. Again, for the second time, he went and prayed, My father, if it cannot, uh, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And so we'll, we'll stop there. He goes back a third time, it says, and he prays the same prayer. This is suffering. <laughs> this is suffering to a degree that you and I will never know and never understand. Even if you are killed for your faith, it won't be like this. Okay? And you will not be drinking the wrath of God from the cup because Jesus drank it for you. If you're in Christ, you don't have to bear any of the wrath of God, praise Jesus, because that's what gives you eternal life, is that He already bore that punishment. Okay? So, this is the suffering. And, and don't think that, oh, through His life, though. No. Read the Gospels. Read the truth of the scriptures. As he said, uh, you know, Jesus wept, John eleven thirty five. 35. Uh, uh, Matthew 4, before he goes, he's in 40 days, 40 nights fasting, he says, I hunger. On the cross, he says, I thirst. All these are just accounts that have just come to mind, mind by the Holy Spirit right now to say it shows his humanity. He was 100% human and 100% God. And I understand we can't fully understand that. But he, he felt every whip, every thorn on his head, every spike nailed into him, he felt everything, okay? Uh, and he dealt with the temptations that we do and did not sin. Okay, that's, that's this Jesus that we continue to unpack. So, you can have confidence now as we close out verse 16. Because of this, because of who he is and what he did, you now have confidence and you now have access to God, which you never have. Because you were alienated from God and without hope, as Paul says um, to the Ephesians and the Galatians, you were without hope uh, outside of Christ and outside of God. But you've been cleansed, you've been purified of your sins by the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and that is only available through his blood. And since it's in Hebrews, I'm flipping to it real quick. Chapter 10, verse 19 to 23 says, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened up for us, the curtain, you catch it? Same language, same stuff. The curtain was opened by him through his blood. That is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Not partial assurance. Full assurance assurance of faith. And notice the word there. Let us draw near. Isn't that what he's saying here? Draw near to the throne of grace. Right? Draw near to Jesus. With our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed pure with water. Let us hold fast. Same verbiage. Hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Hold fast. Don't waver. Stand firm in the faith. And that way you are able to boldly approach with confidence the throne of grace to receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Anybody ever have a time of need? Anybody ever want God's mercy in that time of need? Anybody ever need God's grace 
every day, brothers. Every day right here I need God's grace. Okay? Uh, so uh, we close with that. If somebody will look up, um, Dave, would you mind looking up Psalm 46, verse 1? Uh, and so while he's looking that up, mercy and grace. Let's go over that really quickly. What's the difference? Somebody can tell us. Mercy and grace go hand in hand, yes. But what's the difference? They do, yes. But there is a difference. What is it? Do we know? So mercy is not getting what you deserve. Uh, mercy is... Yep, George, you were speeding, and by all rights, the cop had you, and you should have had a ticket. And mercy is, he said, I'll let you go with a warning, and he didn't give you a ticket. That's mercy. Grace is receiving something you don't deserve. Grace is, uh, you don't deserve, Pete, you don't deserve Martha's banana cream pie and the last piece of it. But, graciously, these guys have not eaten it, and there's one piece left for you. So grace is getting something you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Does that make sense? And so I put it in context of this verse here to say, he says you receive mercy and find grace. Do you see it? Both and. Mercy you need for forgiveness when you sin and you fall into temptation. And you succumb to that temptation. Because you still do. And I know you do. Because I do. You still fall into sin and temptation. You still give into it. And you need mercy and forgiveness for that. You need grace to strengthen you when temptation's coming. So that he will graciously strengthen you so that you're able to resist that temptation. You see it? Both sides of the coin. You need, you need both and. and that, grace and mercy. And praise God, we receive them both through Christ. So let's close, if you would, Dave, with Psalm 46.1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help. Amen. Praise the Lord. Jay, would you pray us out? Sure. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Heavenly Father, creator of the universe. Uh -huh. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, the wonderful counselor, almighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Yes. And thank you for being so mindful of us. Yes. Sending your son, Jesus, for having mercy on us, yes. giving us grace, bringing us to salvation, uh -huh. to enter your rest. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you.